Welcome back. Well, I'm relieved to be at this lecture already. I'm thankful that we've been able to get here. And th the reason why I'm relieved and can actually just take a breath of air is because we are about to land back on the Word of God. When we started this lecture series, we built a biblical foundation. We spent time, the very first lecture, we asked, what does the Bible say about the end of the world? Does it even exist? Then, then we asked uh, the question, who is God? Jesus Christ showed that He is God. We then looked into the structure of prophecy and how to understand prophecy and the chiasm. Then in lecture four, we came down the left-hand side of the chiasm into the great controversy. And then lecture five, we took off. The first four lectures, we were trimming the wings and fueling the plane. Lecture five onwards, we took off. And I warned you that we would need to fasten our safety belts because the information would be pretty shocking. And now from lecture five all the way up to where we are now, we've been uncovering more and more and more and more satanic deception. Deceptions that have reached into Christianity, into Hinduism, into Buddhism, into Judaism, into all religions, even into the secular world through evolution and other aspects that are just pertaining to the satanic deception which Lucifer, when he was before, as he was in heaven, had gained control over a certain portion of the angels and now he uses them to roll out this terrible, sly and deceptive way of trying to gain control of people's lives. The problem with deception though is that you don't know you're deceived until you wake up or come out of deception. It's like being asleep. You don't know that you're asleep until you wake up. When you're falling asleep at night and uh, you're reading a book or whatever or you're rolling around, you don't actually know when you fall asleep. You only know you were asleep in the morning when you wake up. And that's the same with deception. People often come to me and they say, well, I'm not deceived. The problem with that is that's exactly how deceived people think. I didn't think I was deceived. So we've been through all this effort of trying to put this puzzle piece together, this one little mosaic piece after the other, showing you how the satanic deception really works. And now we're going to take all of that and show you how it fits into the context of the Bible. The Bible very clearly has got a three angels messages passage that comes about in Revelation. We're going to open the Word of God. If you have your Bible available, turn with me to Revelation 14. If you don't, pause the DVD and fetch your Bible and let's read this together. Revelation 14 verse 1 onwards. It says, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Here's a passage in the Bible that speaks about a group of people. And interestingly enough, if you do the um, cross-referencing, you'll see it's the 144,000 that are sealed in their foreheads. We'll get to the seal just now. What's this idea of the mark of the beast? We'll get to that just now. Well, here's a group of 144,000, and they are singing a new song. And only they can sing the song. Now, that's sometimes difficult to understand. What do you mean by a new song? They're singing a new song. Well, this is a song of redemption. This is a song of salvation. This is a song that only the 144,000 will be able to sing. And if you go back in the lectures, you'll come to the, the one where we discussed the 144,000. It's not a literal 144,000. We've shown that. It's not a literal 144,000. It's the group. It's 12,000 times 12,000, meaning multitudes upon multitudes of people that are saved and taken to heaven. And these people can sing a new song that only they can sing. This is related to a, an, a conversion experience. 
Only once you've been through conversion can you speak about what it was like to be converted. Through your experience, you can sing a new song of thanks to the Lord. And this group will be singing a new song that only they will understand and have experience of because they will have gone through this conversion experience. Let's read further from verse 4 onwards. These are they which were not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This text is got split up into various sections. Let's just break it up and analyze what it says. These are they which are not defiled with woman. What does that mean? Well, I know of somebody, it's a very sad story. What happened when this person read this text is he divorced his wife because he says that here it says, these are they which are not defiled with woman and he won't be defiled, therefore he will have nothing to do with woman. That's not what it's about. In the Bible and in prophecy, the Lord speaks about the church as the bride, the pure woman versus the harlot or the impure woman. These are they which are not defiled with woman refers to these are the, the saints that have come through this conversion experience which have not been defiled by associating with false doctrines or doctrines embedded in false systems of worship. False women, harlots as it were, whores, people that are whoring after other gods, church systems that contain elements of rat poison. Remember, just one thing that's wrong. These are they that are not defiled with women. These are they also which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. This is the group of people that will do what they have to do, but they'll stand on what the Bible says and what Jesus Christ says, and they will follow that no matter what. These are they that follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth, without compromise. These are they that are redeemed among men, being the first fruits unto God. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. These are the people that you won't find lies in their mouths. You won't, they, they are without fault. This is a pure group. Okay, so how does this then relate to the three angels' messages? Well, they are three distinct messages that go out into the world at the end of time. Read with me from Revelation 14, verse 6 onwards. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is a message, a calling that goes out from this angel into the earth. And it says, have, this angel is carrying the everlasting gospel. And then it warns that the judgment is come. Right? He's, the glory has come. Give glory to God for His judgment and the hour of His judgment is come. And on the back of that, worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the waters, etc., etc. So what's this judgment story? What is this all about? What is this angel calling about? Now this is not a literal angel. This is a process of awakening of the message within a group of people about coming back in line with the Word of God towards the end of time. It's described as an angel flying in heaven and it's a message that goes out into the world that warns the world about certain apostasies and certain things that have taken place. What is the standard of judgment that would be used in this case? James 1 verse 25 is very clear. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed indeed. This is confirmed in James 2 verse 12. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What is the standard of judgment? The law of liberty. And people today say, but there is no sin. And we've even seen some of the religious leaders saying there is no sin. Well, what is sin? According to the Bible, 
the 1 John 3 verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So if according to 1 John 1 verse 8, you deny sin, then you're being deceived. Read it with me. It says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see, where there is no law, there is no sin. Romans 4 verse 15. So, if you're traveling down the highway and there's no speed limit like the Autobahn in Europe, in Germany, you can travel at whatever speed you want. If there's no law governing your speed, then you cannot break the speed limit. But if they put a 120 kilometer an hour signboard up, and then they enforce the law, they say you will not travel faster than that, and you decide to travel at 160, you are then breaking the law. So the determination of whether you are breaking the law or not de is determined by whether there is a law or not. That's why many of the churches today, especially the Christian denominations, they say the law has been done away with. But think about it in reverse. If there is a 120 kilometer an hour speed limit on the highway and you decide to travel at 110, there's also no law against you. You know that there are certain barriers that you're not allowed to cross. And if you don't cross them, that 120 kilometer an hour law does not come into effect. That law only comes into effect when you break it. Does it make sense? Only once you travel faster than 120 kilometers an hour, do you need to feel guilty about that 120 kilometer an hour signboard. That's why Romans 4 verse 15 says, where, the, where no law is, there is no transgression. So either on the outer barn where there's no 120 kilometer board, there's no transgression. Or if, you, if there is a law that's guiding you and you're not breaking it, there's also no transgression. But according to the word of God, in Romans 6 verse 23, it says the wages of breaking this speed limit, as it were, the, the wages of breaking the law of God, the wages of that, which we call sin, is death. But the Lord always gives you the one and then He gives you the other. So He says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is going to be against you at the end of time when the law, you've traveled faster than 120, so we're going to have to discuss your punishment. Oh, but in the same vein, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the Lord always says, here's the speed limit, but there's the Savior. You see, sin separates from God. It doesn't bring people closer to God. It drives us away from the Lord. And as Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, but your sins or your iniquities have separated from you from your God. This is a, a way of Isaiah writing about the things that have separated mankind from how it was in the time of the Garden of Eden. Oh, how I long to be able to walk in the Garden of Eden and rub my fingers through the mane of a lion. How I long to be able to run and let my children run and play and pick fruit of the trees. How I long for the diet to be restored to what it used to be, that we can get rid of these greasy fatty hamburgers and go back to the purity of the diet as it was in the Garden of Eden. How I long that no longer will there be animals killing each other. More of this will be discussed in Creation to Restoration, the lecture at the end of the series. Sin has separated man from God and driven him down and down and down. And today, where mankind is being driven like cattle towards accepting a new world order, the final events are about to take place. John 8 verse 3 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman, taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she says in, 11, in verse 11, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This is the righteousness by faith that is offered by Jesus Christ. 
Here a woman is dragged away in having been caught red-handed, busy with adultery. And they drag her in front of Jesus Christ and they, put him, put, they drop this woman there and are about to stone her, condemning her to death for adultery. Jesus writes, he kneels down and he writes with his finger in the sand. There's only three times in the Bible where this is done, where the God writes with his finger. Once he wrote in stone with the finger of God, he gave us the Ten Commandments. The second time he did it in King Belshazzar's time with the writing on the wall, we spoke about the kingdom being given over to the Medes and the Persians. And the third time is where Jesus again kneels down. It's always got to do with judgment or correction, coming back in line. He kneels down and it says in Jeremiah, he starts writing in the earth the sins of the people. Here Jesus is writing basically, Mark, you've sinned so and so, and Johnny, you've sinned so and so, and Michael, you've sinned so and so. And as the people realize what is being written, they have to drop the rocks. Because he who, had the first, ha, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And as Jesus looks up, he looks around and he says, well, woman, where are your accusers? You know, has no man condemned thee? What, why were you, haven't they condemned you? And she says, no, Lord, no man, they've left. Then Jesus says to her two very important things. He says, neither do I condemn thee. And that's where Christianity stops today. Today, you can do anything, you can think anything, you can continue on with anything because Jesus won't condemn you. But Jesus has always got two pillars to his truth. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So on which condition must she continue on this path? By continuing under the 120 kilometer an hour board. See, Jesus died for our sins. He died to save us from being fined for traveling too fast. He died, in other words... Uh, that's just an example. He died, in other words, that we won't have to suffer the consequences of our sin, which is eternal death. But he says, go and sin no more. Now that you understand and acknowledge and are able to recognize your sin, go and sin no more. Romans 6 verse 14 and 15 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Here the, what's being explained here is exactly as I've said. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Which means don't break the 120 kilometer an hour board. Because then you are under grace. And then the question, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law? And that's why people say the law has been taken away. No, you are not under the law. You're not being condemned because you're traveling uh, slower than 120, right? And then he says, but because we are not under the law, should we then sin? God forbid. And that's the strongest wording that can be used. God forbid that we go faster than 120 kilometers an hour. God forbid that we sleep, or we do adultery. God forbid that we use the, names, the Lord's name in vain. God forbid that we get involved in anything that might cause us to steal, etc., etc. The law only comes into effect once you break it. Romans 3 verse 19 and 20 say, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight. For thy law is the knowledge of sin. You see? Only once you break the speed barrier, you give recognition to the fact that you're going faster than 120. Only by breaking the law do we recognize or have knowledge of sin. We have to be taught the law to recognize that we are breaking the law. And Romans 3.31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. In other words, by following what Jesus said, by working through him in faith, do we then remove the law? Does it not exist anymore? Oh, God forbid. By doing so, you establish the faith. By traveling 110, you are enforcing the law of 120 kilometers an hour. That's what he's saying. Except naturally he's referring to the moral law. You see, Romans 7, 12 says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. 
You see, there are four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just like when you buy a car or you b purchase a house, you need witnesses to witness next to you. You need three or more people to sign a document to make it valid. The same way, the gospel of Jesus has been explained in four different ways to make sure that there are witnesses for what took place. Matthew describes Jesus as Christ the King. Mark explains Jesus as Christ the Servant. Luke describes Jesus as Christ the Man. And John explains Jesus as Christ the Divine. Four different ways about speaking about the same subject so that we get the full essence of who Jesus really is. It's the same as the five books of Moses. Genesis shows the Christ our creator and redeemer. Exodus shows Christ our sanctuary. Leviticus is Christ our sacrifice. Numbers is Christ our guide. And Deuteronomy is, explains Christ our reward. The same as in the Old Testament is the same as in the New Testament. That's why Jesus says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He hasn't come to take the law away. He hasn't come to take the moral law away. He took the ceremonial law away. It was part of the crucifixion. We know that. But Luke 16 verse 17 from the NIV Bible explain. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop out of the law. Okay, so what, are, what is the law? The law is the Ten Commandments. It is, it is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for one element of the law to drop away. Isn't that incredible? Those are profound words. One element. Can you think of one element of the law that you might not be in line with at the moment? 1 John 5 verse 3, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Hebrews 5 9, And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Today the world has de-emphasized obedience and overemphasized grace. Today, the world says, it doesn't matter how fast you drive on the highway, the 120 kilometer an hour board is for the losers as at the back. Jesus has saved you and you can do whatever you want. You can speed on the highway, whatever speed you want, because Jesus will save you at the end of the day. That's not true. That's a lie. He can only help you if you acknowledge and obey and submit to his authority. The same way the 120 kilometer an hour board is on the highway, the same way the moral law is the speed limit of our lives. And today where the world de-emphasizes obedience to the moral law and overemphasizes salvation by grace, you can fornicate, you can do whatever you want, but Jesus will save you. That's not true. That's a lie. And that's why when you look into the New Testament, you can see the first commandment in Matthew 4 verse 10. The second commandment in 1 John 5 verse 21. Third commandment, fourth commandment, all the way through to the tenth commandment. Each one of them being repeated and reiterated throughout the New Testament. The Old Testament spoke about the tabernacle in Numbers chapter 1 verse 51 to 53. About the tabernacle, the sanctuary being pitched in our midst. It's the Old Testament. The New Testament in John 1 verse 14 speaks about Jesus Christ who is in the midst of his people. Christ with us, Emmanuel. You see, the one is a fulfillment of the other, a typology. And just how, do you remember, we, we went through this in the previous lectures about how every year the Passover lamb was offered at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. And while the priests were busy preparing the Passover lamb for slaughter, Jesus was being crucified outside the city. They didn't recognize their own prophecies and look what trouble they got into. Four days before the Passover lamb was offered, they would take the lamb into the house with them. Four days before Jesus was crucified, the Sanhedrin condemned Jesus to death. Type and anti-type. The Passover lamb, not a bone was allowed to be broken on its body and it was, uh, had a skewer stuck in it in order to roast it. Jesus Christ, not a bone was broken in his body and he was stabbed with a spear. A fulfillment type of anti-type. 
Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is depicted through his sanctuary. The entrance, the single entrance, depicts the one way to Jesus Christ. The high priest points to Jesus Christ. The burnt offering represents Jesus Christ. The ashes represents Jesus' judgment on the wicked. The labor for washing represents Jesus washing away our sins through baptism. The sacrifice of the lamb is represented in Jesus' innocent death on our behalf. The holy place represents elements of our life focused on Jesus Christ. And the most holy points towards and shows us in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ in the throne of God in heaven. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. If Jesus Christ wasn't a fulfillment of the typology, he couldn't be the lamb that takes the sins away from the world. This is the everlasting gospel. That angel says, or well, the angel as is flying through the air warns us to worship him that made heaven and earth. That angel has got the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? Righteousness by faith through the, the outpouring of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. The acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is the everlasting gospel as given by the first angel's message. This is a call going into the world, asking the world to please acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, not one of the other gods. Jesus is your God. Listen to what he says. What about the second angel's message? Revelation 14 verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. These are very hard words. And as we work through this, it gets harder and harder. Not difficult, harder, these messages. Remember Babylon was a religious system in the olden days, and it's pointing to a religious system in the New Testament as well, which in the olden days, was very attractive to the Israelites. Babel, Babylon, Babel, standing for bab -el, another gate to God, the bab -el system. And I'll get into the Bab of the Baha'i movement in the next lecture. The gate, the new gate, also starting in this interesting date of 1844, which we'll look at in the next lecture. Well, here's this woman riding the beast, who's making all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. As Sister White writes in two selected messages, The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah hath blessed and sanctified for the use of man. Also, it is the immortality of the soul. These kindred heresies and the rejection of the truth convert the church into Babylon. Kings, merchants, rulers, and religious teachers are all in corrupt harmony. This is a very hard message. The constructs of the wine of Babylon are twofold. Number one, the acknowledgement and the acceptance of the false and spurious Sabbath. And number two, the acknowledgement and acceptance of the immortality of the soul. On these two foundations are built the biggest lie that the world has ever seen. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Here are the people that do keep a specific Sabbath and have the righteousness of God, the faith of Jesus Christ. You see, the, you can't keep nine of the commandments. You can't keep three of the commandments. You're either breaking them or you're not. And the Bible says if you break one, you break them all. Mystic Babylon, as we explain in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, Mystic Babylon has got three components. Do you remember what they were? Read it with me. It says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of de devils working miracles. Do you remember that? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Well, the dragon we've discussed. And now... I hope that this will all start to make sense. Here's this message coming out from heaven. And now I'll take all the, the lectures that we've done and put it in so that it makes sense. 
Here's a warning about this mystic Babylon of which one part is the dragon. Do you remember this, this quotation from Professor J.S. Malan? The inverted cross is not broken, but turned upside down. It indicates the rejection of Jesus Christ and the contempt for the gospel of salvation. People who are sometimes sacrificed to Satan on the Black Sabbath are crucified upside down. This idea of an upside down cross has something to do with the dragon. Can you remember who the dragon was? The dragon is who? Satan. Now this is a new quotation which I'm adding in for the first time. And you'll see sometimes there'll be these. I'll use some to remind you, to bring it back in your memories. But others I'll add in. And if you go back into the lecture, the seat of the dragon, you'll see something about the upside down cross. This is just another quotation on the same confirmation. What is the papacy or the Pope doing with the cross behind him? On the where there you can see CNN says, Pope visits holy site of the Sermon on the Mount. The inverted cross has been a satanic symbol since the 7th century. The various inverted crosses shown are signs belonging to satanic worship. At satanic meetings they are used in various ways to desecrate and mock Jesus. Here are four more images that happened when uh, the Pope visit, visited the holy site of the Sermon on the Mount. A warning in the Bible in the second angel's message is, be careful, there's this mystic element of the dragon. Do not get involved. What about the bent or twisted cross? Did we see that element of the dragon coming through? It says, according to the Roman Catholic author Pierce Crompton, that the, this bent crucifix is a sinister symbol used by Satanists in the 6th century that had been revived at the time of Vatican II. This was a bent or broken cross on which was displayed a repulsive and distorted figure of Christ, which the black magicians and sorcerers of the Middle Ages had made use of to represent the biblical term mark of the beast. Yet not only Paul VI, but his successors, the two John Pauls carried that object and held it up to be revered by crowds who had not the slightest idea that it stood for Antichrist. The dragon, is it starting to come back? Let's continue. Malachi Martin, who's a pontifical professor at the uh, Vatican, he explained in Windswept House that, or he at least he vividly described a ceremony called the enthronement of the fallen archangel Lucifer, purportedly held in St. Paul's Chapel in the Vatican. Interestingly enough, the enthronement was linked to the concurrent satanic rites in the United States on June 29, 1963. Not only that, he, it's explained in the Woman Rides the Beast on page 420 that one finds every shade of New Age occult and mystical belief inside the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic world had an entire issue affirming the New Age movement without a word of condemnation or correction. You've seen this picture twice already through these lectures. Catholic priest has yen for zen. It makes no difference if you're involved in meditation or Buddhist meditation, or Hindu meditation. Or as long as you acknowledge the immortality of the soul, you are in line with the Catholic doctrine as well as all the other pagan type religions. Do you remember this one? A hundred priests or a hundred Catholic priests have signed up for the world's first university course in devil worship and Satanism, now officially underway in Rome. This unbelievable acknowledgement and admission that they are actually involved in this stuff and then I showed you the wandering bishops these are the bishops that are pushing the new age movement and you can see by the hand signals who they who their affiliation is with this idea of immortality of the soul is one element according to the writings of Ellen White one element that makes up this mystic Babylon the one is the spurious Sabbath, which we'll get to just now. The other one is this immortality of the soul. A reincarnation allows this immortal soul to come back in and uh, lead you to a higher karma every life you come back. And that is the process of evolution, growing and growing and growing until we reach Godhead. You remember this magazine cover from the Krishna movement? Back to Godhead. Here you have the founder. And his, they call him his divine grace. You remember Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, Osho as they called him, how these, interestingly enough, the European people specifically worship this man like he's a walking, talking God on earth. I showed you the Bhagwan, the, the uh, 
the Rolls Royces and all the video clips I've, which I've shown you of these people being worshipped as if they were God because they have a certain divine element inside themselves. And then the Maitreya who appeared in 1988. Six years after he was advertised in newspapers, the Maitreya is here. 1988 he appeared in Nairobi and he healed certain people and TV sets went on and this man's face and Jesus' face was, was uh, seen right around the world. Not only that, interestingly enough, the Fox sisters had some interesting things that happened about a hundred years before that. Today we see it, this tombstone, if you like, that says the birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon the site stood the Hyattsville cottage, the home of the Fox sisters. There is no death. There are no dead. Do you remember this? We went into detail in the lecture, what happens when you die? So that you can see what happens when you die to understand, do we have an immortal soul? Because this is a belief system that is being spread around the world. This, this uh, J. Arthur Hill who writes in Spiritism, History, Phenomena and Doctrine of it, he writes, The fundamental principle of Spiritism is that the human beings survive bodily death and that occasionally under the conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. I showed you also John Edward and various others of these clairvoyant type people who were involved in speaking to the dead. What did the Bible say? Psalm 146 verse 4. His breath goeth forth and he returneth to the earth. The splitting up of the two elements. In that very day his thoughts perish. He's finished. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where thou goest. The people are asleep. They don't know anything. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Most clearly I think of all Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6 say, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Could this be clearer? There's this call to become or to acknowledge the immortality of the God within you. This is pantheism. And that this God continues after you die. This element of God within you. This is pantheism. This is satanic. The Bible says when you die, you're asleep. And it's by acknowledging life after death, as it were, you're opening the door for Satan and his demons to impersonate the dead. The progressive thinker in May 18, 1929 said, What spiritualism is and does, it removes all fear of death, which is really the portal to the spirit world. It teaches that death is not the cessation of life, but mere change of condition. Spiritualism is God's message to mortals, declaring that there is no death, that all who have passed on still live, that there is hope in life beyond them, even for the most sinful. Incredible. Is this serpent language or is this God language? This is serpent language. And the reason why the second angel's message goes out and warns us about this Babylon that is acknowledging the immortality of the soul is because it's being accepted more and more and more widely throughout Christian circles. Even in the church where I grew up, there were services for the dead. We gave communion to the dead. We baptized the dead. We even gave the dead the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that I was part of a system of acknowledging a lie from Satan. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known that. And here on their website, even today, it says the New Apostolic Christian's belief in the beyond. This is the acknowledgement of the place of waiting. You don't die and go to heaven or die and go to hell. You go to a place of waiting. That's a lie. It doesn't exist. This belief in life after death opens the ways for Satan to deceive mankind. What about evolution? Why is this idea of evolution so widely accepted in the world today? Do you remember the Time magazine article and the Sunday Times from the Roman Catholic Church? It said, Genesis is nonsense. 
The Catholic Church has officially debunked a literal interpretation of the creation according to Genesis as utter nonsense. Time magazine said, Vatican thinking evolves. The Pope gives his blessing to natural selection, though man's soul remains beyond science's reach. See the problem? Evolution is fact. Okay, that's, that's fact, they say. Evolution is fact. In other words, it's not creation, and it's not pure evolution. It's sort of natural selection by the hand and guide of God. It's that theistic evolution that we've been through. And natural selection gets its blessings from the Vatican. Not only that, on the 9th of July of June 2006, the Pope's Evolution Seminar to be published. Here Catholic theologians see no contradiction between their belief in divine creation and the scientific theory of evolution. And Christianity today, more than ever before, believes in the spiraling of this evolution spiral as we are spiraling towards Godhood. We came from a rock of some plasmatic soup, some mollusk. We climbed out of the water, became mammals, climbed back into the water. Some of them stayed on earth, on, on land, and from there it's just sort of spiraled up. And the next level is this, this ultimate spirituality as we're spiraling towards Godhood. This is a Catholic belief. This is a satanic belief. Because without creation, you remember, there's no mighty God. Don't let anybody ever tell you that it's God shows his majesty through evolution more than in creation. That's a lie. What's more impressive? To have a production line, to have parts coming in here and a Mercedes going out there, or to have no parts and to go, dung. Bah! And there's a Mercedes. What's more impressive? That's creation. Without creation, there's no almighty God. Without an almighty God, there's no single authority. Without a single authority, there's no judgment, including the judgment that was given at the time of Noah. And without judgment, there's no need for repentance. So the evolution theory leads people to realize and accept and acknowledge that there's no need for repentance. On the back of that, they then add the rapture, where you now have got a second chance. It doesn't matter if you don't go the first time, you've got a second chance to make it. That's satanic logic. Revelation's end time call. Do you remember it? Revelation 14 verse 7. Come back and worship him who made. Read it with me. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. I am the creator Please acknowledge me according to my authority. Acknowledge me according to the things that I have set up. I want you to know that I am your God. Not some silly evolutionary reincarnative process where you're spiraling towards Godhood. This call is a call that goes out from heaven and its urgency is one that should reach every soul on earth. We've looked into the dragon and I'll continue now with the beast in part two.